but we'll move straight on to climate snapshots where your peers are going to be very courageous and come up and do the snapshot format, which some of you will be familiar with, which is six slides in six minutes. And that can be quite a daunting format to do for a presenter. So you know, we'll all be very supportive, but we know it works because it gives you that, that very quick picture of an, and a, a very good impression of six projects all at once. And then they'll participate in a Q&A so we get to learn more about their projects. So if they could join, join us up here on the stage. I was just going to introduce you first. Oh, okay. Our first snapshot is the Lairg and District Learning Center and the Kyle of Sutherland Development Trust. And they'll be talking about how, how they're working collaboratively to support each other in their work. Hello there. My name is Jane Dixon and I'm the manager of Lairg and District Learning Centre. We're located at the crossroads of the north in central Sutherland, an area that has more sheep than people. We are famous though as we hold the largest sheep sale in Europe once a year and we've recently learnt 1.2 billion years ago that an asteroid landed in Lairg. <laughs> the charity was set up in 2003 following the popularity of IT classes which were held in village halls and we've grown to over 4,000 centre users per year. Our remit is education. This is because the closest college is 50 miles away and we offer employability training because our local job centre is 77 miles away. We tackle social isolation and community cohesion by organising all-inclusive events and offer a range of recreational classes and clubs for all ages. Thanks, Jane. Hello, my name is Sarah Forrest. I'm the Project Officer for East Sutherland Energy Advice Service. I'm delighted to be invited here today and speak to such an influential audience. We're managed by the Kyle of Sutherland Development Trust, which is based in Bona Bridge. We're 10 miles down the road from Jane. The Trust was created in 2011 to ensure that long-term sustainable benefits could be generated throughout the community. By October 2017, Total inward investment as a result of the work of the Trust and its partners was £5 million. Projects include the building of a visitor centre at the Falls of Shin, a community cafe, a health and fitness classes, the Ardguy Village Regeneration Scheme, which will be the gateway to Sutherland, community broadband and East Sutherland Energy Advice. Our project is Energy Savers, Training to Gain. And we're running ahead of our slide. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> what we're doing is we're teaching students how to transform pallets or waste wood into community assets, like benches and planters. All ages are having a go. We've been really excited. Um, at the top photo, you can see there are children, and they're making wooden pencil holders. The next photo down shows adults, and they're making bird tables but it's all from wood that was destined for landfill. Old furniture is also being given a new lease of life. In fact, one upholstery student has become so inspired that a flooded uh, static caravan, which was destined for landfill, is now her special makeover project. By the way, does anyone have scales big enough to weigh a caravan? Because it would look great in our stats. <laughs> Our Ready Steady Cook event, which is the large photo that you can see there, that pitted a local chef against learning centre staff. And the winner was CCF, because our cookery classes have been full ever since. Students have been doing all sorts of things. They've been composting, growing food, mending and altering clothing, taking food gluts and making them into preserves. They have been upcycling and recycling anything and everything. The seed is sown. People are now connecting with their carbon footprint and will continue to nurture them and feel privileged to help watch them grow. The dark red or orange of this map shows fuel poverty in the Highlands, which stands at 74% and reflects the situation many of our clients find themselves in. 
The area is off gas, so reliance on wood, coal, electricity and oil is high. Most of our clients live in Highland Crofts, which are notoriously difficult to heat. Combine that with low incomes and high fuel bills, and you have a perfect storm of fuel poverty and high carbon emissions. Quite often, our clients are doing their bit for the environment, but this is driven by the money in their back pockets, not any overriding concern for climate change. Our job is to help advise them on both counts. So as well as to undertake home energy visits, we hold community events like Energy Bingo. We give energy efficiency prizes away, like light bulbs or draft excluders, which show labels with CO2 and cost savings. When we found out about the funding, we met to find out how each other's projects complemented each other and how we could help each other. We take Sarah's leaflets along to our events and energy cafes, talking about their services to our students and occasionally allaying concerns about home visits. We also give free advertising in each prospectus to their project. And we give prospectuses out to our clients and nurture individuals, trying to help them out of social isolation by participating in other CCF activities. We hope we give them that extra nudge or confidence to go along to the centre. We also gain moral support from each other, such as talking at this gathering. <laughs> <laughs> Working in tandem has strengthened our community's engagement in CCF themes. Energy saving, waste, grow your own and cookery. When we worked together on the slides and Jane sent hers back to me, all in colour with lovely pictures, I felt very anxious. Hers looked exciting, enticing, Twitter and Instagram worthy. Our photos were of things like thermostatic radiator valves <laughs> or fail double glazing. I felt our presentation looked dull. The truth is that while Jane has Highland coos and cue towels, pictures of small children making pencil holders out of recycled wood, both projects are important because we have the same goal, lowering carbon emissions. I've learned not to be insecure about my photo library and to learn that by working closely together, by referring clients to each other and supporting each other's events, we are operating a pincer movement, encouraging people to think about their actions, the impact that that can have on their carbon footprint. It's almost in the air in Sutherland. Sarah's just voiced her concerns, but we worry too. How do we evidence the impact of our training effectively? Surely meter readings that she can provide are stronger proof. These fears are understandable. Because of the competitive nature of grants, it can lead to a nervous coexistence between third sector organisations. Rather than being allies, people can worry about job security or meeting their performance indicators and actually lose sight of the bigger picture. Our collaboration has led to a wonderful creative synergy. The CCF message is being reinforced in Sutherland because together we're tackling a wider range of carbon issues. We're reaching more people and we're dealing with local challenges as a team. Our projects are all consuming, time our greatest challenge. And with 50 miles to the closest CCF project, we could feel isolated, but we don't because of the bond formed. Together, we have helped put Sutherland, a region that we can't let people forget, firmly on the carbon awareness map. And that's a great feeling. At the beginning, we were so excited by our projects, but then reality hit. There's a lot to deliver, and there's another CCF project just down the road. What does that mean? Well, we met, we chatted, we planned, and it's brought invaluable benefits. We use our differing client bases to support both projects, and we work collaboratively for a stronger outcome, such as our project is making an eco doll's house for Sarah's project. We even persuaded CCF trainers to come to us that shared resources, but more importantly, allowed them to experience our challenges firsthand. Sutherland is a unique remote part of the UK with its own local rhythm of life. Communities are sparsely populated and rooted in proud coffering traditions. They do not want to ask for help. It's a world apart from the central belt where the decision makers reside. But its unique challenges don't mean that communities don't want to engage in carbon literacy. Openness has brought trust and a healthier working relationship. It's been a joy to see our CCF projects flourish in partnership. And our next CCF grant applications show us as partners, working together to tackle climate change, 
and help more communities reduce their local carbon emissions. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jane and Sarah. I couldn't think of a better way or a better example of how to introduce and illustrate the benefits of collaboration and sharing. That was fantastic. And the next one is from Leap Renfrewshire, and they're going to talk about developing uh, multiple partnerships. Good morning, everyone. Um, great to see many of you here. Um, I'm talking on behalf of my whole team and my community. It's just me up here that got the nice job. Um, I'd like to talk about LEAP and what we do, and particularly about um, groups and organisations that we work with and how we work collaboratively across Renfrewshire. We started off, as many of you probably have, as a group of six volunteers interested in climate change and in our community and wondering how we can tackle this. Um, we started in a rural, rural village of Lochrannock. Um, which you all know, of course, yeah. Um, population of about um, 1,800 people. And uh, we started by supporting our local community, and then we realised the other villages next to us could probably do with something similar. So we expanded across Renfrewshire into other small rural villages, and eventually um, we've worked for the last few years across um, the whole of Renfrewshire last year, which is a population of 175,000 people, and we interacted with about 3,500 of those people last year. Um, it's an urban and rural mix for us now, so we started off rurally and now we work in more urban areas of Renfrewshire, um, in Paisley and Johnston, bigger areas like that. Um, and our, our, um, our um, thermal imaging, draft testing, draft proofing, working with young people, and we work with older people teaching them to draft proof. We work with younger people teaching them green skills like building boats and um, a, uh, upcycling skills like these. So we do home energy advice, including a handed person service, to help implement measures for those who are financially, physically less able to implement them themselves. We do waste events such as bike swaps, sock workshops in schools, clothes swaps, upcycling. We would work particularly with participative learning. We found this is a really good way of working, where we get people learning by doing them things themselves. So I think you probably, a lot of your groups do the same thing. You get people hands on. Um, and now that we've learned about this sheet side to middle thing, we'll probably get involved in that too, I'm sure. Um, so we learn from lots of organizations and our community. So how have we worked in partnership approach? We are at the center of all things, of course, there's us. Now we work jointly with all of our partners. Um, there's a lot of people in there from Renfrewshire Advocacy Service, Citizens Advice, Community Nurses, Food Banks, Renfrewshire Action on Mental Health, Set Housing Associations. We help to jointly set up and establish the Renfrewshire Advice Partnership, which is an online portal um, where we can re refer seamlessly in the background um, vulnerable clients to each other, different organisations. So people get the help that they need. So we benefit from referrals. We also do joint workshops together, such as home literacy, home energy literacy with um, adults learning groups. Um, we do events such as having a stall at a housing association gala day or coming to talk at events for um, other organisations. Um, through working together, we've, we've been able to um, tackle all issues in our communities, such as climate change and fuel poverty, which is a big issue in Renfrewshire. Um, we've also accessed funds and schemes to complement and dovetail into and enhance our CCF funded work. Um, scheme big, we like to say. So we've delivered um, external wall insulation projects, benefiting over 50 vulnerable people in 21 homes. Um, this is jointly delivered with Energy Action Scotland, who are a um, fuel poverty charity. And we've also worked with Renfrewshire Council Tackling Poverty Commission to work specifically with um, households in, in hardship. So we've project managed these, so we've been the guys on the building site. Um, and we've also done the Make It Happen programme, which is smaller energy efficiency measures, which can have um, equal good benefits for people. So things like radiator panels, um, insulation internally in houses, um, even thermal line curtains. We've done our Closing Out the Cold project is our latest one, which is working with vulnerable households who are moving into properties. We identified a particular um, situation in uh, 
housing associations and other um, areas where people were moving into properties with nothing, maybe being homeless, maybe being leaving prison, maybe being um, split up from their family, things like that. So, so how do we work together? Um, we reach those who need us most, right? So that's our focus. We want to fuel poverty and poverty are a big issue in Renfrewshire. We'll, we work with everybody across Renfrewshire, but we know that, that some of the people that need us most are sometimes missed, are sometimes the people that fall off the radar. So we have a one-stop one shop for vulnerable people. We have referrals between our organisations, so we help to uh, get people that, the help that they need, reaching those who are hard to reach. Um, our organisations, by working together, can jointly deliver their goals and more. So uh, somebody who comes in for debt advice into a Citizens Advice Bureau can also get energy advice from us to help to alleviate that whole problem of the debt in the first place and also keep them warmer. Um, our organisations in our community also grew up with grassroots like we did, so they know their own community. Um, we can do bigger things together and we can have a stronger voice in a political, in a political scene when we're all talking about the same thing. Um, about 20% of the work that we do now comes from referrals and James Hare is one of them. Um, our partnerships have, haven't always been easy. It's not an always easy road. We uh, work together. We can deliver different types of, of things. So we can deliver events. We can do mentoring. We can do joint funding bids. We can act as a supplier for different organizations. Um, it's important to talk together at the outset and continuously to agree what works for us, what works for our clients, what works for our organizations. By the nature of our CCF groups, I'm sure we want to help everyone. You can't always help everyone. So be, be sensible and try to deliver well on the things that you can and talk about it when it's not working out. Um, there are risks, can be big. We took a big risk in doing a massive external wall insulation building project on, on 14 homes and 21 in the end. So, um, you know, that's a, a quite a big learning curve for us. Um, so I'd just like to leave you with James, who's just gone past. He says, um, he was in, referred to us in field debt, and we supported him with energy advice and measures. Um, he ended up at the end of our help, and we're still helping him. He's got seven pounds left in the meter. We've reduced the carbon footprint of his home, and he's warmer and happier and more confident in what he does. Thank you, Jen. Uh, that is a, a very useful example, again, of, of the benefits, but also what you have to take into account when you're forming those multiple partnerships, you know, what the capacity, the risks, et cetera. Very useful. Um, our next project is, uh, next snapshot is about working with a national agency and SCORE Scotland will be making that presentation. Good morning, my name is Jolly Oluka. Um, I'm the development officer of the Green Features Project. Uh, strengthening Communities for Race Equality, Scotland, SCOA Scotland, started in 2004. Uh, we target all minority and ethnic communities focusing on West Edinburgh, and that is where most ethnic minorities are. Our services are designed to break down barriers and enable meaningful participation of our project communities in all aspects of civic life. Our work includes the Green Features Project, uh, our youth work program, age seven to 24, the local community voices project, and we also provide advocacy and support to our project communities. In all this, we enable our project community to participate very well in all that we do to make sure that whatever is hindering them from participating in all mainstream activities, they are able to do that. Uh, we have been funded by the Climate Challenge Fund uh, since 2013, uh, 13, 15, 16, 17, and currently 17, 18. Uh, we aim to raise awareness of climate change, to give support to all communi project communities to be able to take action, individual action in their daily lives, to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, our main elements are home energy advice, food growing, and uh, transport. We provide people with the uh, support to grow their own food at home to make sure that they buy less from the market. And we just don't give them support. We do do the work with them. Provide energy advice. Uh, in energy advice, we go to their homes and we give them tailored advice and we also support them to learn how to cycle 
from knowing to which side of the bike to stand, to mounting on the bike, and being able to, to pedal and cycle on the main roads. So it takes a bit of time to do that, but our project communities have been able to really grasp what we do. We also provide awareness raising events to enable them to understand what climate change is, because most of us having English as our third or fourth language, it's difficult to understand climate change and make sure that everybody understands it and what they're able to do, and they do it. Uh, we've worked in partnership with many uh, organizations that have enabled us to do the work that we do. Same for Scotland, uh, KSB, Home Energy Scotland, Prospect Housing, My Adventure, uh, CCF Network, and Cycling Scotland, and many others. I'll speak mainly about Home Energy Scotland. Uh, Home Energy Scotland has been our big, biggest supporter. Um, I remember when I started this work, my background is demography. Um, again, I said English being my third or fourth language, difficult to understand what climate change is. But when I started, I called Home Energy Scotland. Rather than them saying, come to, my, to our office, they said, we will come to you. And they came and guided us and supported us. They signed us up. They trained us uh, understanding energy efficiency. Let us know where we could get the city and girls energy awareness training. They gave us uh, shadowing opportunities. They trained our volunteers. They helped us to understand everything around climate change and being able to deliver energy advice. We have been able to support a number of homes. The last year, we supported 50 homes. And out of those homes, 42 homes were able to reduce their energy uh, usage, uh, resulting to those times of carbon reduction. And also were able to reduce on their energy bills, which is a major uh, deal to many of our clients. We have been able to improve um, the energy efficiency of four homes, and eight of our homes were able to access uh, the warm home discounts. A volunteer's capacity to be able to speak to their peers about uh, energy efficiency has also improved, and people have been able to understand what climate change really is, and we are able to use their project resources, which makes it easy for us to deliver projects. And of course, working in partnership with others uh, helps us to access their resources. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can just get their resources easily. There are always a point of call whenever we face challenges. We just call, their lines are open, and they quickly respond to whatever we are asking for. Shared knowledge and costs, making the pound go further uh, has been one of the benefits. And our clients are able to access varied uh, resources and opportunities. We're able to deliver and reach a diverse um, community. And then our resources are able to be used very well. However, it takes time to build and strengthen partnerships, so you have to keep going. And effective communication is really, really key when you're working with partners. Uh, partners, you need to choose your partners wisely, of, uh, especially when you're delivering the Climate Challenge Fund, which is one year. You can't, you can't delay. You have to keep, you have to keep moving. Uh, partners have different values, and sometimes there are mixed messages and confusion, and there might be some frustrations and fu unfulfilled strategies. Partner agreements and initiatives can sometimes delay, but that shouldn't hinder you from working with others. Thank you very much. Well done. I think our, our speakers are doing quite well with the format, and uh, you know you can see it is a bit of a challenge, but very very useful lessons there. Our next snapshot is about mentoring, which is something new with the, the as a formal program with the CCF, and that's Fourth Environment Link and Tullybody Healthy Living. Sticking closely to the format so far. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've not practiced terribly, not terribly much, have we? No. In the garden, in fact, last week for 10 minutes. So, 
Um, thanks very much for having us along today. Uh, my name is Emily Harvey. I'm the development manager at Fourth Environment Link, and I look after all our food and growing work. Fourth Environment Link wasn't always Fourth Environment Link. Uh, we've been around for about 20 years, and we started off as a nature club in Kippin many moons ago, delivering environmental education. But we've since grown in size and remit. And um, our sort of general aims and visions are linking people for a greener, healthier future. I like to add happy in as well, because it all kind of fits together. And we do this by working with others on environmental and food issues, supporting and encouraging people, developing projects with communities, doing education and delivering practical action. Our four main areas of work are active travel, circular economy, food growing, and we also do some consulting work as well. And our current projects include Stirling Cycle Hub, Stirling Food Hub, Revive Falkirk, Falkirk Active Travel Hub, Stirling Food Assembly, and Dig in Falkirk. There's a few more as well, but that's our main ones. Uh, my name's uh, Sarah, Sarah Watts, and I work for Tullibody Healthy Living, and we're a local uh, charity, community-led, and we do all sorts of activities um, around health, and we think of health in the broadest sense, so your physical, your mental, but also how you're interacting with other people and the place that you, you live. And so we run a whole lot of different uh, projects, we have job clubs, we run health walks, um, we have a community garden, we also have a fruit barrow, and at that fruit barrow, this is crucial to the story, we sell low-cost uh, fresh fruit and veg to our community um, because they want to eat more healthily. Okay, so our uh, current climate challenge fund projects are Sterling Food Hub and Revive Falkirk. Um, what's common across both our projects are that we want to reduce carbon emissions, that we want to increase pro-environmental behaviour across food and growing, um, circular economy, uh, active travel. But also we want to help increase skills and confidences of people in terms of growing their own food, cooking their own food, being able to cycle or walk places, or being able to build a table out of pallets like we did yesterday at uh, our Revive launch day. What's also common uh, to both projects is that we have an element of income generation. So in the Sterling Food Hub project, we have Sterling Food Assembly, which has been running for a year. It's an online local food market, which is basically a two hour sales point on a Thursday. And in its first year, it's generated 60,000 pounds for local small scale producers, of which we're very pleased and happy about that. And with the Revive project as well, we'll also be supporting members of the community and volunteers to make their own produce out of upcycled goods from wood products to textiles, which they'll be able to sell through the shop as well. Perfect. <laughs> we must have planned this. We did. We must have planned this. Um, so I actually work for a Tullabody Community Garden, and Tullabody Community Garden came up because customers at the Fruit Barra wanted to eat more local food. So our project did a feasibility study, looked at different places, and decided to build uh, the Tullabody Community Garden. Um, we, with Climate Challenge funding, thank you, we, uh, we actually built it in a year. And the project runs, is run by volunteers. So volunteers come in, give their time, grow fruit and veg, and then we sell that fruit and veg back to our community through the fruit barrow. We also, like a lot of you, we do lots of other things. Uh, so we run uh, cookery workshops, and we also try and encourage people to grow their own, and we host all sorts of uh, community events, so a bit of upcycling goes on. You, you know the score. We do, we do a little bit of everything. Uh, yep, that's me. OK. And um, next slide, how we work together. So... Oh, yeah, that's me again. That's you. Right, OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, Fourth Environment Link have been actually instrumental in supporting our project right the way through. So as members of our management group and our steering group and then our management group, they're helping us with ideas and suggestions and can reflect on what's helping, helping lo happening locally. So we can feed that into our very local uh, project. We also do a lot of 
practical support. You do, thank you yes, very much. We, do. We, do. <laughs> we turn up and we so build and make a... stuff and yep. share things. Yeah, an incredible amount. So actually physical hands-on coming and helping, resources uh, that we can share and use. So the Apple Crusher was at, uh, Juicer was our, our open day event the other day. Mm -hmm. That's right. So a lot of sharing goes on, a lot of um, lessons learned and, and we both improved as projects because of it. But also our organisation, um, it works really well with Sarah because we get to feed all the learning into some of our strategic partnerships in Stirling Local Authority, Falkirk Local Authority. So, for example, we were at a consultation a few weeks ago where I talked about Tullabody uh, Garden and it just keeps sharing the knowledge. What happens as a result? We got some funding. Both, both projects have received funding. We're achieving our outcomes for both of our organisations across environment, health, social outcomes. We feel stronger when we work together because we share our learning and our experience. And most notably, more land is used for growing and more people eat what they grow, which we feel very proud about. And also, we got to be on TV together, which was great. <laughs> Not us personally. No, our, our team members got to make jam uh, and, and featured on CBB, so we're quite excited about that. So I think a lot of the benefits that uh, the previous snapshot speakers have talked about, we, we, we feel. We definitely uh, learn from each other, absolutely. We definitely do things better. And we also, it sort of inspires us a little bit as well. So two examples of that. Um, one is uh, Fourth Environment Link's Food Waste Challenge. So they've got a whole package of activities that they've trialled and done out and they gave us all of those activities and we put them into our last climate challenge fund application so we're really keen on reducing food waste but we didn't have to reinvent the wheel like somebody mentioned that earlier we just took their resources we modified them to our own ends <laughs> um, and a local uh, a local situation uh, we cut down a little bit on the plastic usage within those but that was fantastic that saved us a lot of time and energy uh, to do that. The other thing um, that I like to see that we saw as a little bit of a challenge, but for a long time um, I think a lot of people have been trying to say, well actually cutting down on your meat consumption can actually help, uh, uh, help, help cut your carbon. And uh, we found some uh, research where we could actually measure that carbon cut. So if anybody, this is a call out to anybody, wants to come and sign um, our pledge to the veg, uh, <laughs> Please come along. All it is, it's, it's just you saying, I am going to try and eat two main vegetarian meals a week. That's all. And I know that I'll be contributing my little bit to a little mm -hmm. bit less cut cows burping. That's right. Over that. Very quickly, learning and reflection. We've done a lot of learning and reflecting over the years. I'd like to say we've been in a fairly enduring partnership for about eight or nine years, I think, now. And I think the key thing yeah. that comes out of it for both of us is actually effective partnerships do take time. It's building relationships, mm -hmm. it's understanding, it's agreeing, it's a lot of what the other uh, snapshot co contributors have said. And we think, we have a challenge, if you like, for the Climate mm -hmm. Challenge Fund, <laughs> we think there are two things uh, that could re will really, really help uh, with this. Um, we want to see, as Rosanna was saying, we want to see everybody, communities, individuals, doing something to cut carbon. So we suggest that maybe the Climate Challenge Fund should look at funding regional champions who work and go out to other organisations. We're all there, we're all doing it, we're trying to do it, to try and get them to start cutting carbon, however small or large. Um, the other thing that we think needs to happen, and we do appreciate that Climate Challenge Fund are looking at two-year funding, but honest to goodness, small community organisations need longer-term funding. We need three to five years. It seems a bit, a bit ironic to put lots of resources into a one-year pocket of funding, and then uh, another project starts up somewhere else, and all of those resources are lost. And you need to bring people along you need to keep them going. You need to make it habit. So, so the end of the sentence.
thank you and, and uh, interesting ideas there at the end and I'm sure that some of those ideas have certainly on the funding aspect have been communicated um, already so but it's good to reinforce that. Our next uh, project snapshot to hear from is about sharing expertise and that's with South, from South Seeds. Hi there, so my name is Casey Dixon and I am the Energy Officer for South Seeds. Um, we are based in the south side of Glasgow in Govan Hill. Uh, it's one of the most densely populated regions in Scotland and it has a really diverse community um, which is fascinating to work in but uh, also brings with it um, you know, a lot of challenges too. Um, we have a number of projects going on. We have active travel solutions, uh, community gardening, um, reducing waste, um, and also the energy efficiency and advocacy service. Um, and we have a shop based on the main thoroughfare in Govan Hill on Victoria Road that you can see up in the top uh, left hand corner for you guys, I guess. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really transformed the organization. We used to be based in, in a wee pocket uh, in the community, but now we're on the main thoroughfare and we get a lot of, a lot of people just dropping in to see who we are and just to speak to us and have a, a bit of a conversation. Um, so yeah, so the, the act of travel, as you can see, we've got the, the bike storage solutions up in the, the top uh, right hand corner. Um, we've also done accessibility studies for a new cycle lane which is going in, which again is going to transform uh, our area and also it's going to run right by our office. So it will, you know, we'll really be a part of that transformation. Um, what I'm here to talk to you today about though is the energy efficiency project and that's um, what I'm involved in. Um, and so it's a home energy audit service. Um, so we do a home visit um, and we then follow that up with a report. Um, and we have an energy efficient handy person service to do things like draft proofing, insulation, um, the installation of like pulleys, like closed pulleys. Um, no idea where, why everybody took those out of their tenement flats as they are a great invention and you know, we're really encouraging people to reintroduce them. Uh, we also have an electricity monitor loan scheme. Um, so that's a free one month loan and we go out and install an electricity monitor and it allows people, you know, it doesn't reduce people's um, electricity use but it allows them to see how much they're using and what they can maybe do to, to reduce um, their electricity use by changing their behaviour. Jeez, it moves pretty fast when you're, uh, when you're up here, doesn't it? <laughs> Um, so who we work with, um, we work with a range of organisations, both national and local. Um, so we work with um, you know, like Glasgow Food Bank, so they make referrals to us um, and we support some of their um, you know, clients to do warm home discount applications or go, and, go out and support them to reduce their gas and electricity use and make their homes warmer. We work with the local housing association, which again is also about um, referrals. Um, we go into local schools. Um, just to increase awareness of our organisation um, and um, work with some of the pupils as well. Um, we also um, yeah, work with Home Energy Scotland and Warmworks um, you know, to access things like um, the Warm Home Scotland scheme and that's for getting like, central heating installations uh, into people's homes. Um, and with Home Energy Scotland we recently did a, an event as well um, just to raise awareness of um, you know, what you can do in, in tenement flats to reduce the um, energy consumption. So moving on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so that is the event at the bottom there that we ran with Home Energy Scotland. So we had people from Historic Environment Scotland, Glasgow City Heritage Trust. Um, and for those of you that don't know, we predominantly work in pre-1919 tenement flats or Victorian era homes. Um, and so it's all about what you can do to restore warmth to your historical home. Um, and that was a great event and um, you know, we got a good turnout to it. Um, probably the highlight of it was the food from Ranjit's Kitchen, which if you're ever in the south side of Glasgow, would highly recommend it. Um, the top left fo photo is uh, a family that we got one of the Warmworks installations done for. Um, and contrary to what Warmworks, you know, sometimes say, this, this one took over a year to get in, so we might be the ones that are, you know, pulling down their statistics a wee bit. But, you know, we worked really hard to get that installation done, and for reasons I won't go into, it just took that, that amount of time. Um, and we also do things like warm home discount applications and energy trust applications to clear people's energy debt. Um, so by working with other, others so far, this, this um, CCF project, and this is just up to September, so from April to September, we have managed to do 500, um, supported 500 residents who have dropped in look, looking for uh, energy advice. We've done 40, 
44 home energy visits, um, 144, 141 residents have received LED, LED bulbs to lock in energy savings, and we've made or received 48 um, referrals to and from other organisations. Um, as well as that, in October we've had 110 drop-ins to our office, we've fitted like 15 LED bulbs, um, done around 10 home energy audits and we've had 11 referrals made to us or by us. And, and as a lot of you will know from working in the energy field, um, as it gets into winter, things just kick off. Um, so, you know, the, the, the stats just kind of go mental at this point. Um, and we also started a financial tracker in July 2016. And since we started that, it has recorded over um, £80,000 of funding that we have kind of channeled into our local, our local community through either warm home discounts, um, warm works installs, energy trust referrals, or through um, dealing with energy suppliers and getting billing adjustments. Um, Finally, sharing, sharing how we work. Um, so we've produced a, an energy audit manual, and um, some of you might have seen it if you are doing energy efficiency projects. Um, I am the South Seas poster boy, so I'm also on the front of that manual, embarrassingly. I've managed to restrict the photos of myself in this presentation to kind of that one there and the one of me holding a bulb but with a decapitated head at the beginning, thankfully. Um, so yeah, it goes through everything from community engagement, how to conduct an energy audit, um, how to write a report, how to act on your findings, useful organisations, and we also put in some case studies. In addition to that, um, we've also produced an energy audit film, which is on YouTube. Um, and again, I cringingly star in that. Uh, I'm still waiting on the phone call from Quentin Tarantino. Um, and we've also got a range of fact sheets um, on our website as well, and we will continually add to it. Um, so just if you know if you want any support with your energy project, then then go on there. Or equally, you can um, drop into our office. We've supported. I think four to five other CCF projects this year have come into uh, South Sea's office um, for support with how to start up their energy project or how to kind of improve it or um, you know make things um, work more effectively. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much me, I think. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Casey, and I'm sure everybody will be downloading that YouTube, checking it out. But, uh, but that is a great thing about the uh, CCF projects, is they're not precious about you know, holding their resources tight to them. They want them out there, so make use of them. Our last snapshot is uh, the group Nan Kayan Shangho. Do I have that right? And they're going to talk about their involvement with the ethnic minority network of the CCF. My name is Nassim Solomon. I am. Uh, I was a climate challenge coordinator. Nari Kalyan Shangu. We have been going strong for 30 years this year, and we basically are there for South Asian women and their families. We are there to help them. We hold one-to-one -one, uh, support. We have platform for women and their families for health and welfare. We have workshops and we do training for childcare and we have after school clubs as well. We've got a nursery. Once we've given them training in after school care and nursery, we find them jobs as well. We are there to basically help them understand, I think, what the new world is all about. Now, we give them lifelong learnings in providing them with English classes. The older ladies that we've been here for a while don't have much understanding because they're mostly housewives. The younger ones are a bit different. So that's what Nari Kalyan Shangu started off as. The Climate Challenge Initiative, um, basically our aim was to raise awareness of what was happening in the world, was raise awareness of how us as an individual we can help. Our women did question us, say, what can I do on my own as an individual? So we started telling them that every little bit helps. It's like little drops of water that will make an ocean. So that's where we started off. Energy, we supported the families. Most of our ladies left it up to the men to set the central heating, to change the life bulbs. That was all a man's job as far as South Asian women were concerned. 
we started visiting people in the homes and teaching them how to set the central heating system to make sure it came on time. We explained to them how it works. We taught them how energy bulbs work. Basically, our aim was to teach them cooking, leftover food and that, a lot of it. How have we worked together with others? We started off as an individual organization, but then we started working with other organizations. We worked with ALREC, we worked with The Welcoming. Most of these other organizations, we learned a lot from them and we gave a lot in exchange as well. We worked with Home Energy Scotland, Zero Waste Scotland, by providing advice in people's homes itself. So we went with them to start off with and we did a lot of training with them. In case we collaborated with a lot of other organizations and through our learnings, we did end of year festival. We've done it for two years running with them. Now, collaborating with other organizations was at first a little bit difficult for our women as well. But then we learned a lot and we gave a lot in our shortcomings. That's what I would say. And they taught us. As an organization, once we worked with botanic gardens, we started teaching our ladies how to grow home cooked food, um, or seasonal produce, and then how to cook them. Through that, we managed to make a recipe book, and then we had short videos as well. I am going very fast. <laughs> I'm not keeping up with them. I'm sorry. <laughs> Now, we have done a video of uh, our recipe books as well as the work that we do. And this is when we didn't have any funding last year. We didn't want to leave a gap, but we wanted to keep on teaching our women that you have to keep on going. We applied for funding again, and hopefully we get it this year. So we, with the workbook, and especially with the recipe book as well, so we kept up with the classes, so that we're hoping that we can teach them further so there is no gap at all. Benefit of working with the others was sometimes we have a very short, narrow outlook of our life. We don't look beyond that. So when the others come in, they teach us that you know, there is other, other way of doing the same thing that we are doing, but we are stuck in the way. So that is how we work with the others. Well, that's how we benefited. So when we had the CCF celebration and when we had the festival, we, we had um, leftover food demonstration, which was good because we taught people that these are basic things that you can cook very easily. We had, uh, like somebody mentioned earlier on, the people with gray hair, I have got more than one gray hair, I've got a lot of gray hair. We learned that it was a way of life to reuse, reuse, reuse. And that's what we taught the younger ones, and that's what we had at the festival. We did. We worked a lot with Botanic Garden, and we have kept it up. They have been fantastic, really fantastic in making us understand how to regrow, how to cook seasonal produce. We don't have to buy food that comes from abroad, and we had to make the ladies understand why that was so important. Um, best use of resources, what's available with us. We had a lot from India, Pakistan, Africa, we managed with the Royal Botanic Garden to bring seedling seeds from abroad, mostly Kenya, my background is Kenyan, and for them to grow. So we are working at the moment. Things that we consider as weeds, that we can reuse it and we can cook it, potato plants, potato leaves, which we thought were poisonous, but no, Bengali ladies cook them, but there's a way. So we learned and so did the others. So hopefully, this year as well, we have worked earlier on this year, and they have included a couple of our recipes in the, the Botanic Garden recipe book. So that way. Thank you very much. Now it's your chance to be able to ask some questions of our presenters, if you want to join, join us up here for panel discussion. And we'll, as we started a little bit late, we'll, we'll run this a little bit later so you have time 
So I'm sure you do have some interesting questions. And we'll also, if, if there are any coming through the live stream feed, um, Tim somewhere will raise his hand and tell me if there are any questions. And so you can please, you know, when you ask your question, please say your name and where you're from, and if it's directed to a particular organization. We already have one for the live stream, so shall I take... Tim, is that right? So we'll take, take that one first. And meanwhile, the rest can be thinking about Okay, your this questions. one's a bit of a cheat, actually. Um, this, um, we had um, leg up earlier, um, all the way down from the north of Scotland, and we've just got um, guys up there as well in leg watching the live stream, um, saying it's fantastic to be able to join the gathering via the live webcast. We've got other focus on there as well, so welcome to you guys. Please do ask questions to the panel if you've got them. I'm just to say thank you for your presentation so far. Cheers. Great, great. That's nice to have. That. Nice to hear that. Other questions from the audience? Surely there's. I'm fascinated. Can you wait, take, take the microphone so everybody can hear you? Okay. I'm fascinated by potato leaves. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> I want your recipe book. <laughs> Where do I buy it? <laughs> Great. Well, well, we'll make sure recipe books and chats about potato leaves over, over coffee break. Other questions? Um, thoughts about it? We've got a question down here in front. Thanks very much. They, they, they were a really interesting re range of presentations you know, from different parts of Scotland. Um, one group actually gave uh, Keep Scotland Beautiful and the Climate Challenge Fund some suggestions. I'm a trustee of KSB. Are there any other suggestions that you have for us in terms of the continual journey of the Climate Challenge Fund? Because you know the idea of regional champions and long-term funding, yes, we would agree. Any other ideas like that where we can actually make these projects, support these projects in a, 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 in a more positive way for the future? I, mean, I think that can be answered by anyone. Any, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah go um, well, first of all, uh, I've been in, involved with Climate Challenge Fund in, since 2008, so I'm sort of a recycled person, if you like. <laughs> mm. So I've been following the journey for a long time. And I think we're all collectively evolving and learning as we go along. And I think some of the things me and Sarah were saying is that a, a lot of the sort of mentoring that goes on between us kind of happened accidentally because FEL has a sort of wider reach than just one geography. But if we got a bit more strategic as a government and started to look at our total budgets and not just through Climate Challenge Fund, but across other outcomes that match up and look at how we regionally work a bit more, uh, what's the word, efficiently and measure similar things, imagine the amount of learning that we could get out of that. For me, that's just how my... Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting idea there about almost regional based or area based programs. Anyone else want to? Um, I think uh, a lot of the work that's happening right now um, is has been has been really beneficial in terms of the changes that have been made in the last while with Climate Challenge Fund. We, we were quite pleased with the new application process and the standard of carbonisation, the can't standardisation of carbon counting and so on and that, and made it more efficient for us um, as a team. And the the kind of um, mentorship program that's just started out we're, we're part of the mentorship program and we're we're very very happy to see that because I think Casey said about three or four CCF groups come <coughs> to um, visit and work with we do that as well and we've always done it as an organization I think CCF groups are brilliant at sharing every time we come to a place like this we learn new things and we pick up new ideas and that's probably why we've expanded in all kinds of different directions <laughs> to be honest um, is that we you know we get new ideas and we love sharing our ideas with people so I think formalizing and that every bit has helped, and I have to say I completely agree with the three to five year funding. You know, it's become a three to five year now. I think. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Ten year, what's wrong with that? Coming to higher. Then ten year even. Um, anybody else? Shall we? Well, I would, I would just reinforce yeah. that three to five year funding, just from the point of view that um, we, we, we as a community garden were a new project. So in the first year, we in effect we built the garden, and we didn't really deliver any carbon savings. And it's only over subsequent because we've had three years now of, of climate challenge funding that we've actually been able to sort of embed that those carbon savings in, in everything we do. But 
but it actually ta it takes time. It takes time to set up new organisations. I, I know I know that you know this, um, and it takes time for you to, to to bring people along and to and to understand what you're you're, you're doing. And as I say, we're a health project, but mm -hmm. obviously we're a healthy planet as well as healthy people. So. Excellent. Other questions? There. There's one at the very back. Like Chris Thompson, Living Street Scotland, the Pedestrian Association. Um, thanks to the panel for such a wide variety of interesting presentations. And I think one thing I'd like to ask for anyone to reflect on is how transport fits into this. Because I think for us as a pedestrian association, interested very much in getting more people walking for utility journeys. Through the conversations that you're having, is it really clear to people that this is such a massive potential contributor to our um, carbon savings? Given the latest statistics showing that it's now overtaken energy in terms of its potential for us to make better savings. I think our geography makes it very difficult. We have um, being scattered villages across a county, which is, is we have no public transport in a lot of areas. Uh, the idea of being able to walk is, is just not feasible. And we've tried to engage the mums in not taking the cars and getting the you know, kids to walk to school in the morning. And that will work for any that are you know, local enough to be able to do it. But we have harsh weather. And as much as your heart wants to be able to get people to stop using cars, it's it's actually really difficult to try and find ways to be able to do that. Um, we're, as, a, as an organisation, we're now looking into, rather than students travelling to us, you could guarantee a class of eight, there will be eight different cars that will be coming together, mm. trying to get people to car share and actually moving mm. into let's Skype and let's see if we can actually get people to be at home and do it. But then we have broadband issues, so it just opens up a whole new set of issues. So it, it's, it's really an uphill battle for us, and one that it would be lovely to say, yes, you know, there would be an answer for it. But it's tricky. It's, it's quite, quite difficult for us to be able to resolve it. Mm -hmm. And when we visit our clients, the Kyle of Sutherland Development Trust has got an electric car, so we quite often go and visit them <coughs> in that. But then we have uh, range anxiety because we cover the whole, not the whole of Sutherland, East Sutherland, there's a lot of miles to do. Um, so that's useful for us, but walking is really a bit out of the question, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. As in public transport. Are those? Um, well, I probably didn't focus on it in my presentation. I was talking a lot about what energy work that we do, but we also run Leap Car Club. So we run a car club in our organisation, and we also do events such as like active travel events. So we did an initiative last summer, Cycle for Summer, which saved about 1,000 miles of commuting, where we encourage people to, to challenge themselves to use their bike every day to go to work instead of using cars. So. And then... Mm -hmm. One we, more, yeah. Yeah, we run the Stirling Cycle Hub, and we've also opened in a Falkirk Active Travel Hub, and we're a much different geography, a lot more populated, but we still have uh, rural areas. So what we try and do is encourage people to make everyday journeys by bike or by walking, but we also um, look after the Next Bike Scheme, which is which is a sharing scheme, and that's been really successful because it makes it easy for people. If you don't have a bike or you're only making a short journey or you're only in town for a couple of days, it really supports that taking an active travel journey by bicycle and it's growing exponentially every year as we put in more cycle stations more people are cycling and it's also kind of handy because we can advertise on it as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and I, i'll just add from a, a grants panel point of view it is something that we look at for all projects if it's a village hall refurbishment then we'll ask a question about, well, are they also looking at how people get to and from the hall? You might have a gold star energy efficient hall, but if everybody's coming in their own cars by themselves, then you're not, you're not really addressing the wider question. And, and groups have really responded to that by, by taking a more holistic view of their projects. Are there another sorry, question? Oh, that, sorry, one more that, point? That, no, that really helped us. That really, that, that, that did, um, we, we then just started doing a thing about how people come to our project. And we're, 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 living, we're working in quite a poor area, and actually most people do walk um, to our project, so we were able to go fantastic. But it does seem to me that that would be a, a thing, that it would just be fantastic to have pedestrian resources. You know, it would be good for us to have the information. I think you probably find a lot of our projects are working very, very hard trying to deliver the outcomes, you know, ambitious outcomes that we've set ourselves. And there are lots of things we could do if there were off-the-shelf stuff that we mm -hmm. could just pick up and use or promote or find partner organisations that could do that, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay, there's a question in the sort of towards the middle. 
Oh right, sorry. One here, and then and then over Hello. to there. Uh, uh, I'm from the Chinese Community Re Development Partnership. Uh, on the program, I saw that uh, that particularly the questions for uh, NKS. Well, because it is mentioned about the involvement in the CCF ethnic minority network. Uh, can you tell us more about this network? Hello. I believe you work together. Yes. Uh, very, very helpful to us. Sorry, can you just say SEMVO, spell out SEMVO, and yes, and if you have the microphone. Yeah. SEMVO is the one that brought us together with the other ethnic minority uh, network working here in Edinburgh as well as from Glasgow as well. So I believe we did work with the Chinese organization and I did visit you as well when we had the funding. But again, the same thing happens is when the funding stops halfway, like we didn't have last year, and we lose a lot of our workers, and then to have to restart that again as well to look for them is a bit difficult. Mm -hmm. We work with ELREC, and I believe ELREC has started using, I'm sorry, I was going to answer the question about the cycling as well. We had a lot of problem getting women on bicycles. And especially the older ones which who were under the impression that they only rode bicycles when they were young. Mm -hmm. So we had to completely uh, change the way of thinking. And then we provided them with a platform whereby they could learn how to cycle and fall down and not feel ashamed. So we went through it for two years and we brought them out. And then again, halfway through, the funding stopped. The bicycles were left, not being used. And I think we have work with other organizations that they can reuse the bicycles. Now we have to start all over again to rethink that they can use bicycles on the road, which again is a bit difficult with South Asian women and I should think with the Chinese women as well with the clothes they wear. So we had to, we had a lot of rethinking to change their minds that you can still wear your clothes and still, but be safe. Mm -hmm. So it does take a lot, especially working with the BME community. And I think that um, Jolly perhaps can share from SCORE Scotland. You've done quite a lot of work on walking and cycling as well and overcoming some of those challenges. Oh yeah, um, what we have decided in this, mostly this current year is to train the whole family. Cause sometimes if you train uh, one person, then the other people cannot cycle, so then it becomes difficult to, you know, to cycle alone. So we train husband, wife. Uh, we originally started with women, because the other ones sometimes they're the ones who use cars um, to drop their kids at school. But if their children don't know how to cycle, then it's difficult for them to cycle. So we're training the whole family to be able to cycle together. We do family uh, cycle rides. Um, it's. It's a, it's a very slow process for someone who doesn't know how to cycle, actually, to be able to cycle. But it takes time, but it's, it's, wa it's, a wa it's worthwhile. So it's been slow, but slowly progressing well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good, and, and just to come back on the ethnic um, minority network, if uh, there will be people here that are part of that network, and you know, perhaps if you have other questions, Please do be in touch with them. Is Zarina here? Yeah. yeah. Oh, there she is waving her hand, and she can tell you more about that very active network. Can I take one more question? I'm allowed one more question, because I know there was one right there. Hi. Um, it's less a question and more an observation. Um, when you're, you're talking about um, walking and, and linking up things in rural areas, um, we had a very successful small piece of work that's ma had major implications for lots of uh, the agendas that you're talking about. We had one local path in our village um, restored, and it's made a major impact on all sorts of things. Families and children walking to school, um, access to allotments, um, being able to take the trolley along and the pram along um, without taking cars, um, linking up the path networks from different one village to another, um, so I would say in rural areas, yes, things are difficult, but um, sometimes one small thing can link up all sorts of other opportunities. So we're in West Stirlingshire. I don't know if we were funded through, um, I wasn't in the group that, that restored the path, but I suspect there was probably a linkage there. Um, but uh, that funding and that, that one piece of work has had implications for all sorts of other follow-on networks. 
it's, it's made one half of the village that was quite isolated um, from, from the main resources much more accessible to the main shop, the library, the school, mm -hmm. um, the nursery, the play park, the allotments, um, the doctors. It's made it much easier to actually walk there and, and you know, do several things at once, uh, which people do. That's great news, and it shows how often, you know, just the project alone isn't enough. You need that piece of infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and maybe with the government's doubling of that budget for active travel, maybe there's a, a chance for more, more of those pieces of critical infrastructure to be built to support active travel. I'm sorry, I'll have to draw this to a close because it is time to move on to work, coffee breaks, workshops, and lunch. But before you go, just a few, um, few bits of information. If you've forgotten your workshop or the room number where you need to be, that you, the one you've signed up for, it's on the back of your badge, so you can check that. Um, you won't be coming back to this room until 3 o'clock after you've done the workshops and the lunch. So you might want to take your things with you um, if you need them. And that when you come back here, at three o'clock. It will be for a, a really fascinating talk by Dave Coleman, who's the managing director of the Carbon Literacy Workshop, at, uh, Carbon Literacy Organization. They have a stand um, in the marketplace, and I encourage you to go have a look at the balloons. Just follow the balloons and you'll find them. And that will be about you know, giving you tools, suggestions about how to communicate about carbon and climate, and it's going to be very much a very short presentation with, um, from him, but then really getting your ideas and very interactive, participative session that'll give you something to take home today that you can use in your project. So, so I encourage you to, to come along to that, ready to um, have your ideas to add to the discussion. So next, as I say, it's coffee upstairs. You will be guided by CCF staff of moving you along to your workshop and then to lunch. And, and the workshop will be at quarter to 12, so it's just slightly later. So a quick coffee break and then lunch at quarter to 12. So enjoy. Oh, and thank you.